Hi, uh, welcome to the second lecture in a series of uh, flipped classroom lectures for an introduction to proof course. Uh, the layout of today's talk is going to go like this, basically three parts. Um, there's a few little items from lecture one that I'd like to uh, repair, make a, well, one thing I forgot and one thing I sort of ran out of time for. That shouldn't take as much time. Then we'll talk next about the uh, importance of definitions in mathematics and uh, ending with an example of a definition that's evolved over time, the definition for prime numbers. So the, the end here will we'll, uh, do some experiments with prime numbers, see some interesting facts. Okay. So let's roll. Um, one of the things that I did not mention last time, which I should have, is an additional resource uh, it's called Overleaf, and that's their website. Um, this is a free service that you you can pay for it if you like, and you get some a few extra features. But it's available entirely for free at its sort of base level. Um, what Overleaf does is it allows you to create typeset mathematical documents using kind of the industry standard tool, uh, a software suite known as LaTeX. So um, let me pop open the web browser and show you this. This is the main login page for, for Overleaf. If you haven't been here before, you should register. Um, I have been, so I can just log in. And if you do that. So just a, a few minutes ago, I was testing this out, and I created this new project called Temp. Um, I just wanted you to sort of see what the, the layout of the tool looked like. Um, the, on the left, there's a file browser essentially showing the different elements. The thing that's called main.tex is the object that whose uh, contents are displayed here in the central pane. That's, that's the source code for your typeset document. Um, there's, this one happens to have a reference section. Normally, that wouldn't be necessary. And, and it has a JPEG image of it says universe, but it's really a galaxy. Anyway, that the the main idea is that you'll be typing in the central pane here, um, using somewhat arcane codes, but but you know the, you get used to them, and, and it's worth your time to get used to being able to write LaTeX. It's a, it's a skill set that'll be good for you as a math major and as a later in your career. Um, when once you've made changes in this side, you hit the recompile button and you see the changes in the in the visual output over here. So that's that's overleaf. Now, I should mention why I'm including I'm adding this to the list of resources. In my own courses I ask students to maintain a portfolio of proofs. There are usually about twelve proofs that uh, I ask them to to work on, and, and they work on them progressively so that they refine them a little bit better and better until everybody gets full credit on every proof, usually, by the time they're done. But it's really nice in the end to have this uh, portfolio that, sh that helps you recall the steps you took in, in getting your proofs to a, a cleaner state. Let's see, the other thing that got left off, this was the thing where we just sort of were running low on time, and I wanted to end at just a little over 50 minutes. So this is um, something we talked about as being interesting, but I didn't show you about it. How to multiply two complex numbers, well, how to think about that geometrically. Okay. So uh, let's, let's first talk about some characters known as arg and mod. These are, these are basically ways to refer to the polar form of a complex number. If you've got a, a complex number, it's really a point in the xy plane, but you can think about that in polar coordinates, and you get an angle theta and a radius r. That uh, that's, Those are respectively the arg and the mod. Um, so arg is the angle that the line from the, yeah, this is too complex for me to just talk through it. Let me show it to you. Here's a, a Desmos graph of a couple of complex numbers. I put them in as, I give them labels to be complex numbers, but they're really, again, are points in the xy plane. There's a line that goes from the origin out to one of these, right? And that line makes a certain angle with the x-axis. 
that's the arc of the complex number. The other thing, mod, is how long it is or how, how far it is from the origin. Um, it's weird to talk, to talk about the point 2 plus i being some, having some length, but I, I really mean to think about the line segment that goes from 0 to 2 plus i, the length of that. And that's just Pythagorean theorem, right? We can figure that out. We've got uh, x coordinate is 2, y coordinate is 1, 2 squared, 4 plus 1, the square root of 5. That's the, the distance out. So the mod of this guy is square root of 5. Its arc would be, gosh, we'd have to take the arc tangent of a half. I don't know what that is. It's close to 30 degrees, but it's not exact. Okay. All right, so I've got two complex numbers on here. They both have the same mod because I was being lazy, basically. But they're both root 5 away from the origin. Um, and they have different arcs. This one, well, that one is at a much steeper angle from the line between the origin and it, or is at a much steeper angle than this one. But um, notice because of the symmetry of this particular choice of numbers I've had that the arg of, of the blue one plus the arg of the red one, that's going to end up being 90 degrees, right? So that's something to keep in track, keep in mind. All right, when we're multiplying, multiply the mods and add the args. I think that might be why the word they chose is mod, which starts with an M, and arg, which starts with an A. Multiply mods, add args. That's the whole content of it. If you have two complex numbers, this, these guys both have root 5 as their mod, so the mod of their product will be root 5 times root 5, it'll be 5. And the arg of their product will be the sum of their args, which happens to be 90 degrees. So um, that means that point right there, oh, I can't make a point with this tool kind of, here, let's add it in, 0, 0,5, which if we give it a label as a complex number is literally 5i. 5i yeah. is the product of 1 plus 2i and 2 plus i. Now if you don't believe me on that, then why should I be trusted? Let's just check it out. We could, we could do this with the graphing calculator, but I, I had CoCalc open, so might as well try that here. Uh, is that the one? No, that's the one I wanted to do. So, what was it? 1 plus 2 times i times 2 plus just i. And it has to think for a little while, but the answer is, <laughs> it's making me wait. Why is it making me wait so long? There it is, 5 times i, like we saw, or like we, we guessed at from the args add and mods multiply rule. Cool. Uh, let me get rid of that. So that's the, the ge geometric... Uh, way to think about the multiplication of complex numbers. Oh, I did this example just now. Here's one truly weird thing. The, the number e, as in e to the x, you know, the, the Euler's constant. There's a very strange relationship between e and complex numbers and this mod and arc business. If you have, uh, I'm calling it the mod r, since I think of it as a radius, and the arg theta, uh, the r and theta from polar coordinates, then the complex number with that r and theta can be written this way, r times e to the i theta. Now, that leads to something um, that's probably one of the most beautiful things in mathematics, I'd say, uh, which I, I can't go fast here without showing you. It's called Euler's formula. It's one of multiple things that are known as Euler's formula. But Euler's formula is this, that if you have e to the i pi, well, think about that for a second in terms of mod and arg. I don't have anything out front, so that's like a, a one times, right? It's radius or r is, or mod is one, and the argument is pi. So what complex number has an argument of 180 degrees, or pi radians, and a length of one? Think about that. Uh, maybe I should show it on the on the Desmos graph, 
if um, the angle with my x-axis, the positive real axis, is 180 degrees and my length is 1, I'm, I'm right there where my cursor is, negative 1. So e to the i pi is equal to minus 1. Now that's actually just one version of Euler's formula and it wouldn't normally have that 1 out front. e to the i pi equals minus 1. A neat way to, to modify this is to add 1 to both sides of it, and you get e to the i pi plus 1 is equal to 0. And, you know, if that, <laughs> if you don't find that remarkable, um, yeah, you probably shouldn't be here. Look, this has got five of the most important quantities in mathematics all tucked together into one little formula, one very simple formula. Euler's constant, the square root of minus 1, pi, and 1 and 0, right? It's special. So that'll be that for talking about the, the uh, polar form of complex multiplication. All right, so we're, we're heading into the main meat of today's talk, which is about definitions. So I wanted to start with a kind of an example to get you to think carefully about definitions. So the, uh, the example I wanted to run through to help you think about definitions is a, a silly little question. Maybe people know the answer already. Is zero an even number? A lot of times people think it shouldn't count. In fact, we'll see it actually is. It's an even number. Um, why? Well, it, you know, to be answering a question like that, I really need to know precisely what I mean by even. What's the actual definition going to be? Um, an informal way to say it is, you're even if you're exactly twice some other number. But that's got issues. Right, yeah. Uh, 2 pi is even. Well, it's 2 times pi. So we need to be a little more precise than that, don't we? The question is, what is our universe of discourse? What sort of numbers are we talking about there? Um, clearly, I didn't mean just real numbers, because then, yeah, 2 pi would be an even number if, if our universe of discourse and that were the definition. If the universe was R and that were the definition, 2 pi would fit, would fit. But we know that's not really an even number. OK, so how about this? A natural number is even if it is exactly twice some other number. You like that one better? Yeah, that makes 3 even, because it's exactly twice 1.5. Uh, maybe I'm just quibbling there. All right, fine. Both the number and the thing it's the double of must be natural numbers, right? So, actually, you know what? It's perfectly fine to talk about, you know, like negative 6 as being an even number. There's no reason to restrict ourselves to just natural. So let's, let's be more inclusive. It's sort of broadening the tent. Uh, treat integers as the, as the universe of discourse here. Okay, so here we go. There, we're, we're set now. An integer x is even if it is exactly twice some integer y. Does that sound like a good definition? It probably would even seem cooler if we wrote it in symbols, but that's a, that's a solid definition. Do you notice that I dropped the word other there? It's not just... It, I didn't say x is even if it is exactly twice some other integer y, but just some integer y. Why did I drop other? It's because, well, we're used to thinking that the number and the number's double are going to be different things, right? Because to make something twice as big, it's, it becomes you know, clearly different from the thing you started with. But that's just true most of the time. There is an exception, and it's the one we're after. It's zero, right? So there's no reason to insist on, on that. Be, again, be broader. If we leave that word other out, then ask whether 0 fits that definition. Is there an integer y that is 2, that is the double of, no, I said it wrong. Is there an integer y that if we double it, we get 0? Right, 0 itself. But that makes 0 even. That's sort of a silly example, I suppose. But I wanted you to, th to think about you know, the, the power of definitions in a, in a simple example. Um, notice what the process there, how it, how it went. We 
we asked a question about whether zero was even or not. But we didn't really think about zero itself until the end. The real thing we did was you know, refine and improve our understanding of the definition of what it means to be even. So uh, precise definitions like that are one of the things that makes math extremely powerful. It could be argued that it's also one of the things that makes math have limited applicability. And um, there's, a, there's a whole spiel about this in the textbook that I, uh, I point you to, including a, a reference to Giancarlo Rota's book uh, about his life as a mathematician. So um, I'll just say that there are many things that great thinkers think about that simply cannot be defined with the precision that we can, can define things like even, right? Or many other mathematical concepts. If a, if a thing doesn't, isn't amenable to that precision, then math can't study it. And so then it becomes the domain of philosophers or political scientists or uh, theologists, whoever. Um, okay, so there is a problem with the precision of definitions that we'd like to have. And it's insurmountable. It's something we just have to accept. There is a, there's a fundamental issue. Um, if you're going to define a new concept precisely, you're going to use words that you already think you know the meanings of. You're going to use terms that have previously been defined. And how were those things previously defined? Well, in terms of something else, even more simplistic, and so on and so on and so on. But, you know, there, there's no bottom. Um, you eventually have to get down to, and you need to come to grips with this as a, as a thinker, that some things have to be undefined, primitive terms that we can't really define. But we believe that we commonly know what they are. Um, a, a, a kind of a nice example is the word point. Everybody thinks they know what they mean by a point in the plane, right? It turns out we, we use all kinds of strange things as points in advanced geometry, and they're not the kind of, you know, two real numbers that determine a, a, a coordinate, a, you know, a point in the xy plane. So, um, yeah, undefined terms are a fact of life. But given that we have these undefined terms, from there we build up on that and to, to be quite precise uh, modulo the fact that we've got that boogeyman lurking in the, in the closet. All right. Uh, another problem arises with definitions that we need to talk about. People, mathematicians particularly, often come up with multiple definitions for the same thing. And that's not as stupid as it sounds. Um, sometimes one definition, you know, the, the original definition you may have started with, just doesn't lend itself well to making an argument about something you're trying to prove. But if you have, if you have this other thing, this other definition, it would just fall out. And you go, wow, I wish the definition was this other thing. Darn it. Maybe it is. Right? Maybe, maybe you got lucky. Um, if, you, if you have an alternative definition, the only thing you got to worry about is that it defines the same thing. Right? If you if you have two different definitions and they don't agree with one another, that's bad. But so long as they do agree with one another, then you can jump back and forth using the one that's more convenient for the particular circumstance you're in. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> you know, I made the point in, in speech before I hit the slide. But, but anyway, there is a whole category of proofs that are called TFAE proofs that uh, I don't want you to just know about. We're not going to do one yet. We'll, we'll see some of these later in the book. But to, to know the idea exists, TFAE stands for the following are equivalent. And a TFAE proof will show that maybe seven or eight different statements actually say the same thing. They provide the, the same definition. OK, so uh, we're on to the section about primes, but we're actually using this just as an example of a, of a definition. Here's a pretty standard definition you probably learned in grade school. An integer prime, an, excuse me, an integer p is prime 
if it is bigger than 1, and its only divisors are 1 and itself. That's what I remember. Is that, you guys remember that one? Um, it's weird, because sometimes people will ask, is, is 1 supposed to be a prime? Because 1's only divisors are 1 in itself, but they've got that, that initial clause in there that says the integer's got to be bigger than 1. So they just, by definition, force 1 out. Right? 1 is disallowed. It turns out they disallow 1 for a good reason, which we'll talk about in a, in a minute. This is another definition for prime. An integer p is prime if it is bigger than 1, same first part. And if it divides a product, x times y, then it must either divide x or y, or both. could divide both. Now, those are equivalent. And like I said, we're not at the point where I want to show you the, the, the work of uh, TFAE proof, but it's not a hard one. These, you, can, you can actually make an argument that these are the same. Um, what's interesting, I think, about these is the first definition is really stuck in the integers and ideas about the visibility of integers. The second one can be modified just slightly, and it gets used in other scenarios. Um, the second definition leads to abstract algebra, in particular an area called ring theory, in which you have the notion of primality in, in these abstract settings that are not whole numbers. <laughs> They're not, they can be weird. You can have prime polynomials, for instance. Um, you can have prime complex numbers in the Gaussian integers. Well, we, we'll see those later. But for the moment, just recognize that definitions, while they have to be equivalent to one another, they can have lots of different features and, and have different levels of utility. So since we were talking about primes, I think this is a, a good moment to to see a few things uh, that are interesting about primes. I don't know whether people will have run into this idea before. It's a thing called the sieve of eratosthenes. Now, uh, a sieve, well, a sieve is, is often used in two different ways. If you ever do baking, one of the things you often do is sieve your flour, put the flour in this thing that has like a screen on the bottom and you shake it around and the flour falls out, and if there's any impurities, little chunks of rock or a bug or something, that stays behind in the sieve. So the, the good stuff goes through and the bad stuff stays in when you're baking. Um, if you're looking for gold nuggets, though, you, you shovel the slurry from the, a river into a sieve, and the sand falls through, the things you don't want, and the gold nuggets stay behind there. There the good stuff is left behind in the sieve, and that's actually the kind of sense that Eratosthenes had in mind when he the sieve idea. So what do you do? You basically remove all the things that aren't prime, although you do it in an organized way, successive stages, and you simultaneously are going to figure out what the primes are while you, while you take out the non-primes. So here's how it proceeds. You start off with all the positive integers, z plus. Um, the very first stage is silly. You're just going to cross off one. Why? Because like we said, one doesn't get to be a prime. It's, it's a weird special case that we get rid of. But from then on, you do basically the same process. In each successive stage, you're going to look for the smallest thing that hasn't been removed yet. And you'll circle it and say, that's my next prime. And then you're going to cross off all its multiples. So let's take a look at a figure from the textbook, this one here. Uh, this is an example of running the sieve of Eratosthenes through to the prime 5. But the way this would work is it, in sequence. First, we'd have all these numbers written out with nothing done. I forgot to cross off 1. I should have a big X over 1. But the smallest non-1 number that's on the list would be 2. So we would circle it, and then we'd get rid of its multiples. Now, you see, the way this, the numbers were laid out in, in rows of length 10, the multiples of 2 are really easy to find. They're in every other column. right? That's what these yellow highlightings are all about. Um, fine. Well, then, then 12 and 22, 32, 4, 14, all these, all these numbers that have been highlighted in yellow would be gone. The next stage of the sieve, the smallest thing that wouldn't have been crossed off, or wouldn't have been circled, rather, 
Well, neither circle nor crossed off, come to think of it, would be 3. So we circle that. So our first prime was 2, our next prime is 3. And then we get rid of all the multiples of 3. And that turns out to have a nice pattern to it, too. The, the things that are multiples of 3 lie along, along, along these diagonal lines. So you can cross them all out in, in, you know, rapidly. Uh, and then the smallest thing that wouldn't have been crossed out after both the yellow stuff and the blue stuff have been knocked out, that would be 5. We've identified our third prime number, and then we get rid of its multiples. The, they happen to lie in columns 5 and 10. Now, if you look at what's left behind at this point, it's interesting. Almost everything on here is prime. See how 7 hasn't been crossed out? It's a prime. 11 and 13, 17, 19, these are all primes. 23, 29, they're all primes, right? No. Uh, look at 49 right here. 49 has still not been crossed off. Why has it not been crossed off? Because it would have got knocked out the, on the next stage of the sieve. When we circled 7 and knocked out all the multiples of 7, we'd cross off 49. And that's kind of typical of the way the, the, the sieve of Eratosthenes works. If you've, if you've sieved up to stage P, then you'll have a kind of a good list of the primes up until the next prime squared. So if you've, for instance, if you would sieved using 2, 3, 5, 7, and 11, you're good all the way up to 169, the square of 13. So that's, that's kind of cool that you can sieve using just a few of the small primes and get a good list of the primes much farther out, which means now you could use that list to sieve farther out again. Like kind of a, a cursive structure where you develop the primes. One thing I find interesting about the primes, this is essentially a mechanical process, right? There's an there's a easy way to, to sort of set a, a machine in process that will will eventually discover all the primes. Well, not eventually, because it would take forever, but you know what I mean. It, it, it would make an ongoing list that generated all the primes. Despite that, the primes are surprisingly irregular. They act almost like random numbers, except in certain ways they don't. But, but you know, the, the, the extent to which... Well, let me put it this way. Whenever somebody thinks they've found a pattern in the primes, it's almost always wrong. <laughs> There's exceptions. You might have to go out to primes bigger than 30 billion, but you'll eventually find the exceptions. Um, so, yeah, primes. And the sieve of Eratosthenes. Well, look, I, I couldn't leave Eratosthenes without mentioning the, the person. Eratosthenes is a really interesting character in, in antiquity. He, uh, he became the head librarian at the famous Library of Alexandria. This was like the repository of all the knowledge of the ancient world, and it was burned down to the ground by early Christian zealots. So, kind of bad. There was a lot of really important stuff that got lost there. Uh, but he was the head of this library, and I guess it's, it's probably fair to say that being head librarian at Alexandria was more like being the head of the National Science Foundation here in the U.S. today would be. He was like the chief scientist for his entire nation. And Greece at that time was a pretty massive empire. He lived in about the third century before, uh, what, what do we call it now? BCE, before Common Era. Um, I'm so used to saying BC, meaning before Christ, it's hard to remember because I'm old. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, he was a big deal, but all of his friends, all of the other math and science people of the time, they had this nickname for him, Beta. Now, to understand why Beta is a derogatory, but maybe a good uh, nickname, you have to know that the Greeks actually used their alphabet over again for numbers. That is, alpha meant one, beta was two, gamma was three, etc. They just used the first ten letters for their symbols for numbers. Um, so beta meant number two. He was second best. Except, <laughs> I think this is cool, this is not quite what they meant by that. He was second best at everything. He was the second best geometer. He was the second best number theorist. He was the second best uh, 
experimental scientist. He was this, if you named an area, he was always the number two guy in that field, which is remarkable, right? Now, nowadays, we all have to specialize to such a, a vast extent. He was able to, and you know, it's because it was earlier in the history of the world, but he was able to become not just competent, but you know, number two in several specialties. That's, that's kind of special in itself. Um, one of the, my favorite things about, it, about Eratosthenes is that he figured out, A, that the world was round, and he, but he, more than that, he measured the circumference of the Earth, and he got it right, more or less, to the degree of accuracy that could be expected using the crude instruments he had at his disposal. And that happened 1,700 years before Columbus sailed the blue. Um, Columbus had done a similar calculation and got it completely wrong. He thought the Earth was about six, 000, six or 7,000 miles in circumference, and it's like 24. So um, he thought when he arrived, um, in, I think people now believe it was Cuba, but anyway, some island in the Caribbean, he, um, he thought he was in China. He was off by an entire another continent and plus an ocean beyond that. So, so Columbus was, was not so great, but, well, Eratosthenes was. Um, if you want to read more about this, I, I, another, maybe I should include this in the resources. Um, if you find the history of math interesting, and it can be, um, I'm occasionally going to mention historical anecdotes about things that we run into. Um, a lot of my sources for that information comes from this this site at the uh, University of St. Andrews in Scotland, the MacTutor History of Math Archive. Um, that's what the History of Math Archive looks like. I actually, there, there's an index into the biographies which you can go through, but I actually previously looked up, whoops, well apparently I closed it, so let's do it. Find E for Eratosthenes, scroll down until we get to the R's, there it is. So you can see he, he has a very similar hairline to me, which is interesting. Um, he was born in a town called Cyrene, that's part of in North Africa, the Greek Empire. Yeah. Empire maybe is too strong a word. The, the influence of the Greek, uh, maybe call it a trading empire, uh, extended in, well into North Africa. That library in Alexandria, that's in Egypt. So that was under Greek influence. Um, you might know the guy who Alexandria is named after, if you think about it. <laughs> I'm going to keep that to myself. You should think about that. Anyway, uh, you can read about, Alex, about Eratosthenes there. But I, I wanted to show you this, this picture, which I sketched together fairly quickly. This is, um, this is the geometry of the Earth seen from a distance. Now, there's a couple of features that are exaggerated, but um, Alexandria is right here, and I've shown a tall spire sticking up at Alexandria, an obelisk of some sort. Syene is here, and it's got a deep well here. Now both of these are much larger on the picture than they would be in reality. If, uh, if the well at Syene was this deep, it would be plunging through the crust of the earth deep into the mantle, and it would be full of magma. So probably not useful as a well. Um, likewise, this tower, if it were that tall, it would be well outside the atmosphere, which would be kind of cool. You could go to the top of the tower and then just jump into orbit. But, uh, anyway, the, so that's exaggeration, but the, the basic layout is about right. Syene is on a, an imaginary line around the globe, uh, one of the lines of latitude called the Tropic of Cancer. And the reason that that line is identified is that on a certain day, the, the day in, where the northern hemisphere has the longest day, it's called the summer solstice, light from, well, the, the, the sun appears to be directly overhead if you're on that line. Anywhere else, if you're up here where Alexandria is, the sun is not quite overhead. It still comes, you know, high in the sky at noon, but it's not dead overhead. But if you're at Syene, right there on the Tropic of Cancer, on the summer solstice, the light from the sun at noontime will shine down into the bottom of your well and completely illuminate the bottom. So, having been told about this interesting phenomenon at Syene, uh, Eratosthenes knew that Syene 
lay at the Tropic of Cancer. It lay at a point where light from the sun was coming in perpendicular to the surface of the Earth at that point. On the same day, he measured the angle that the light from the sun makes with a, a vertical tower in Alexandria. And he came up with an answer of about seven degrees. That's probably as accurate as you could be. So uh, um, there's a little similar triangles trick you have to do, but basically the, the radius from the center of the Earth out to Alexandria and the radius from the center of the Earth out to Syene, those two radii have a seven degree angle between them as well. So if you knew how far Alexandria and Syene were apart, you could just scale that up to figure out what a full 360 degrees would be, and that gets you the circumference of the Earth. In fact, it gets you the circumference of the Earth in a unit that they used in the Greek world called a stadia, which I would guess is about 100 meters or maybe 100 yards, a, a length of a stadium. So, you know, the kind of, uh, basically the length of a field that you might play a sport on. An interesting, I think interesting historical note, apparently there were dudes back in this era whose job it was to pace off distances and to be able to report a distance very accurately by maintaining pacing. And I guess they would probably work in teams and average one another out, but they, they practiced walking the same exact length so that they got good at it and, and uh, apparently Eratosthenes hired some of these fellows to walk all the way from Alexandria to Syene and found the, I think it's several hundred miles, right? But they got him to figure out that length. And so he had the circumference of the earth in stadia uh, at what we now believe to be within a few percent of the, of the correct modern figure. That's cool, right? He not only did this, by the way, he also figured out how far away the sun is from the earth, how far away the moon is from the earth. Uh, he he wrote poetry, he made catalogs of stars, he made a, an impressively exact map of the known world at the time. Um, like I said, he was, he was what's known as a polymath. He did a lot of things. Second best at each, but a lot of things. Okay, so uh, I should get rid of that. Let's uh, end up here by talk, talking about a couple of interesting but false conjectures about primes that are in the book. The first one is this. If you've got a prime number and you form the, you calculate 2 to that p, 2 to that prime number minus 1, you'll also get a prime number. That's, that's an interesting conjecture. Why might you think a thing like that was true? Well, um, it works for the first, small, first few small primes. Right? If you stick in 2, 2 is the smallest prime you could use. 2 to the 2 would be 4, and 4 minus 1 is 3, and that isn't prime. 2 to the 3 is 8 minus 1, that's 7. Okay, prime. I wonder if I could do this uh, with a calculator a little bit. Um, let's go to the, to the y equals thing and put in 2 to the x power minus 1. And I'm going to use the table for this. Oh, my table setup is messed up. I've got I to gotta fix that. Table setup will start at 0. And that next one, delta table, change in table, is, is, is the increment between entries in the table. So that looks fine. Now let's do the table again. So uh, when, sorry, when we're at a prime number, like 2, we get an out, a prime number that's an output, like 3. Uh, when we're at the prime number 3, we get the output 7, which is, I'm sorry, I probably should center this a little better so you can see what's going on. Uh -huh. Now the next prime number is 5. Is 31 prime? Yeah, it is. Okay. Wait a minute. So, but what, maybe all these things are prime. Oh no, 63 is not prime. That's divisible by 9, right? 15 is not prime. Yeah. 1 is not prime, but that's cool because that happens when x is 1, which we weren't interested in. All right. 7. Is 127 a prime number? That's going to take a little bit of work. Wait a second. Um, maybe you're, you're good with your primes and you know that. I don't know. But I'm going to I'm gonna cheat because I've got a, a CoCalc's page open here. And CoCalc has a nice 
facility called Factor. So 127 factored is, oh, sorry, run. Maybe I shouldn't have gone with Coke out because I'm now going to have to wait for the network again. So we are, make an argument that these are the same. Um, what's interesting, I think, about these is the first definition is really... <laughs> that was a long time to wait for a silly answer. What is factoring 127 do? It just spit out 127? Oh, I'm worried about that. I think there's also a function in Coke called is prime. Let's try this one. I might be wrong about that. Oh, that was faster too. It just said true. Okay, so it's the, the reason its factorization looked silly is because it's prime, so it doesn't factor. Right? It doesn't split up. If you, if you don't trust me on that, you might try factoring something that does factor, like 63, right? We saw that was, we said before that wasn't. So it's three times, three to the second times seven. Nine times seven, yeah, that's right. Three squared times seven. Okay, so 127 is a prime, awesome. Now I've got to go for a while because the next prime I have to deal with is 11. And is 2047 a prime? Let me put that in. 2047. Aha, it is not. So we didn't have to go very far before we ran into a counterexample. That's what that's called. Um, but you know what? If I didn't have this computer sitting here to use, I might easily have given up when I hit to 7, because 127 was already hard enough to do by hand to figure out that it was prime. 2047? I mean, really, I didn't want to do that. You know, so I might have just said, well, it looks prime, and guessed that this was true. The, the main takeaway I want you to have from, from the talk we're having right now is that if somebody suggests something like this, where you've got this regular pattern or this, this easy way to generate prime numbers, you should be skeptical of it. It's probably not the case. So this one we ran out of into, into a, an example where it didn't hold rather quickly. I wonder what it actually is. Can I, can I factor that? Twenty-three times eighty-nine. Yeah, I probably wouldn't have had the stamina to get through checking, you know, because the way you do this is you keep trying to divide by other small primes until eventually you realize none of them went right. But would I have reached all the way to twenty-three without giving up and saying, yeah, maybe it's prime? That's, I guess, a temptation that one should resist, right? Okay, so that's one of our conjectures dealt with. It's not true. Here's another conjecture we can try. The values of the polynomial x squared minus 31x plus 257, when we're at whole number inputs, those are always prime. Maybe, maybe rather than going calculator on that one, I should just go ahead and do this in co-calc. So, One thing that is useful for you to, to learn is how to sort of automate checking things. Uh, a standard computer science tool is a thing called a for loop. And if you, um, if you like, you can use, uh, sorry, let me show you this precisely. You, if you, once you've learned those syntax, you can just write them out. But uh, it's often the case that it's nice to have examples to, to build from. And CoCalc here has created a bunch of examples. So for instance, under control, I can find a for loop. And for i in range 5, print i. What do you think that does? It prints 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. The, uh, the operator range there is something that's used to get the things that are appropriate for indices into a list of the length given. So the positions in a list of length 5 are numbered 0 through 4. That's actually a fairly common thing in, in computer language, is to start numbering at zero. Okay, so what this did was just print i. Fine. I want it to deal with that polynomial we just had, which was i to the second power uh, minus 31 times i plus 257. 
if memory serves. Let me just check. Minus 31x plus 257. Yeah, I'm using i as the variable because why not, right? So that's printing the values of the polynomial. And the numbers we're getting are 257, then 227, then 199. You know what? I'm going to have to do something a little smarter here. Let's name that and call that x. And then what I'm going to actually print, whoops, I didn't mean to hit the run, because nothing happens if you haven't got a print statement. What I'm going to print is both x and the result of the is prime function run on x as input. Okay, so we got 257, 227, 190, those same numbers, and they were all prime. Let's take this a little farther. How about if we go 20, 250, oh, look at them all. They're, oh, they're getting smaller, but then they're getting bigger again. So I guess, look, they're all prime. Look at this. Doesn't this conjecture seem reasonable now? I've got 20 instances of it being correct. Well, I told you to be skeptical. It's not always correct. But when does it stop? I mean, should we go out to 30? Still all good out to 30. 40? Ah, see, see, there's a couple of falses. When did that happen? Yeah, there's a few few falses in here now. So, okay, it doesn't always work. It works a lot of the time. It works for this big, long stretch of numbers. But, um, again, this is something to, to remember. Patterns don't always last. Prime number patterns, certainly not. But generally, we can see patterns and think, oh, that's how it works. And our brains are used to doing exactly that. We think what a process is known as induction. We think inductively. We see patterns and we extrapolate from those patterns. And when patterns break down the, the, the line, it, it's surprising to us. Um, so as a mathematician, you have to stop thinking inductively. Just seeing a pattern is never enough to convince you of the truth of something. You have to actually have to build a proof, or you have to certainly check it well beyond uh, the first few dozen cases anyway. but. Uh, you know, there are instances of patterns that hold for the first few billion cases, and <laughs> you're not going to check all of those. Actually, people have using computers, but no human being is going to do that. Okay, so that is uh, where we will call it a day for, for this lecture. Um, see you later.